could be I totally understand sometimes if you uh, go for the recorded session and scroll through it probably it would be easier on you especially if you're having a very rough schedule and I know for a fact that you are having rough schedules and it's gonna last until the, uh, the end of March where you can breathe a bit before you start again by mid-April or am I wrong? Yeah. For the students who can put their cameras on for at least 10 minutes, do so. I would love to see you. Hello, Karim. You're good today, Karim. Yeah, I'm great today. So basically, I've been correcting lab three. I suppose you got it. I still have five students. I would uh, continue after the session. Yes, this is one thing. Another thing concerning the midterm, I will send you after class that the midterm, I did not find any time for it. So it's gonna happen during class. Um, ja, just requ I requested for the midterm to be not at 11 though, if we can start at at 10.30, if you guys can, can do it. Yes. So again, Yara, I wanted the midterm to be on Friday evening. And uh, apparently it's not reasonable, especially that Guy, I think, has a midterm on Friday evening. So it's going to be during class next week. Uh, the duration will be around 45 minutes. Okay. And if you don't mind, if you don't mind, if we can start at 10.30. I wanted it to be at 11 because 11 is our actual timing of the class. However, I know for a fact that our official timing of class like on the manager is 10.30. So I believe nobody should be busy at 10.30 unless you have an exam or something, you let me know. All right. Uh, Jad has an exam at 12. So if we start 10.30, probably we can give him a break to breathe or probably to study a bit, review a bit. Okay. I know. Doctor, so is it going to be on Saturday, not on Friday? Uh, no, we couldn't confirm Friday. So it was still tentative until Guy uh, told me. And I think Guy uh, is the only uh, student uh, who replied to my email. He has a midterm at 6 30. Do you want because to? I have a um, quiz at uh, 10 50 on Friday during the regular class time for physics course? Okay, so your quiz okay. for physics is one day before, right? No, and I, I asked you is it on Saturday or in, uh, on Friday just to know because uh, on the announcement on the blackboard you was told us in the video on Friday. Yeah, it was only tentative. So our midterm is going to happen. I'm typing it just to keep it written on Saturday at 10.30 in the morning. Okay. Uh, okay, it's great. Right. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Going. yeah, you thought it was Friday. Yeah, yeah. No, Friday I cannot because I know probably you have classes. So why did I pick Saturday? Because we have our class on Saturday. I didn't, I wanted to avoid this for one important reason. If we take our midterm to happen on Saturday, we need to skip class. And by skipping class, that's bad because we need to cover 10 experiments during the whole semester. I will find a way to overcome this issue, probably give you a recorded session. Probably I can do that, okay? So back to you. If you go back to the announcement, I was simply asking you if we can do the midterm. So it was not confirmed. Okay, so the question was, we could not, a tentative date. Okay, and th this did not work. All right, so anyway, we're not too many. We're only one section. I wanted to pick the best for everyone. And I hope I did, okay? Skipping a class on Saturday for us is not a big deal uh, as long as we can have a reasonable timing. Anyway, uh, the plan for today is the following. We need to uh, cover any question you have from lab five and start lab six. I was doing lab six a few minutes ago. I love this lab, it's easy. It's a bit long though. However, it's easy, it's nice. It's one of my favorite, it's magnetic field. This would be 
your only chance to tackle magnetism. In the next uh, lab, if I'm not wrong, we're gonna do optics, something related to optics. So no more magnetic fields. Okay, yeah, like, give me a second, what's wrong? Okay, I will help you later, okay? Thank you. All right, any question related to lab five? Let me open the lab report. So lab five was basically RC circuits. And I know for a fact that data analysis was easy. I know for a fact that the circuit could be a bit confusing for you. Uh, I know also that the deadline is Sunday evening, if I'm not wrong. So do you guys have any questions related to that? You're fine, you're good? The error on T. Okay, the error on T, I suppose you're doing, you're talking about the average. Please do not find it, it's not needed. The only way to find the error on T though is to do the propagation of error. It's not a real average. By knowing a small T that was measured using a digital measuring tool, and this is another T measured using a digital measuring tool, you can find the error on each. To find the average or the mean or the median or whatever you wanna call it, that is basically the midpoint between those two values. You do this plus this over two. So by doing propagation of error, you can tell the error on the average, okay? Let's not call it average. Let's call it anything but average because I don't want you to do RMS because RMS is not applicable in this case. I think it's interesting to know what the error is for you to have an idea about the precision. However, they didn't ask you for error. So it's only you do it if you need it for your analysis, okay? So again, I need to remind you the lab reports are templates or the minimum requirement, but you can open up as, as much as you can stretch your lab report depending on what you want to discuss, okay? Usually stretching a lab report is interesting when you do your own experiment on your own bench because you could have issues. But since most of everyone is using the same results, you will not have issues. And this is sad. It makes your lab less real and more ideal in a way, you know? Yeah. Any other question concerning lab five? You good? All right, if you remember anything, you let me know. Anyway, I'm receiving your emails and I believe uh, we're communicating well. All right, Yara. So now for lab six, it's your only chance to tackle magnetic field. We need to study, and that's the outline, we need to cover the magnetic field created by a long coil that has a different name. Do you remember the name of a long coil? What do you call it? What did you used to call it in school? In high school, yeah, the solenoid, definitely. And I suppose you did that in the course or not yet? Talking about magnetic fields created. Yes, all right, so you started in the course. We're gonna take the case of a solenoid and the case of a flat coil. Uh, we're not gonna take the case of a strong wi a, a long wire and you're not gonna take the case of a regular bar magnet, all right? So only a long coil and a flat coil. Uh, I'm going to remind you quickly about each, then I will tell you in the experiment what are the variables because you need to vary many parameters at a time, especially for the long coil, you need two variables, so keep everything constant, vary one, then keep everything constant, vary two, and that's it. And for the flat coil, we're going to vary only one uh, uh, parameter, and I will show the lab report for you to see that you have part A, B, C, and D. Okay, all right, so quickly, let me move a bit the cameras and the number of participants. You're barely A7 students, where's everybody? By the way, Shelby decided to drop the whole major. Do you remember how loud he was? We miss Sherby. Okay, anyway, magnetic field created by a long coil, a long coil, What's the difference between a long coil if, and a flat coil? Can you try to, to find some differences? A long coil, a flat coil, what's the difference? It could be a qualitative difference. What do you say? Come on, a long coil, a flat coil. What's the difference? Just say anything. 
The long coil is co long. The flat coil is not long. Anything. You're too silent this morning. What is it? What's wrong? Cylindrical. Both are somehow cylindrical. Okay, the long coil is cylindrical. All right, if I need to give a, an actual definition, we basically tackle the radius of the coil, of the cross-sectional area of the coil, and the length. We usually say for a flat coil, the length is so much smaller than the radius. So we compare the length and the radius. Uh, we don't actually call it length, we call it a thickness because it's too tiny. For the solenoid, however, the length is so much longer than like greater than the radius or the diameter of the solenoid, okay? So this is a solenoid, this is a battery, and it's a DC battery, power supply. So you have plus, minus polarities. The current will flow in this direction. I suppose by now, after high school and the course, you know how to use the right-hand rule. And please do not focus on my camera because I think my camera is flipped. So make sure you rotate your four fingers around the current to find the magnetic field. I don't like the way, uh, I, I don't actually follow this way. I mean by this way, this way, this uh, this hand. I actually use my four fingers for the current and my thumb for the magnetic field, okay? Do I look flipped? Yeah, I think so. So I should cheat and do the opposite for you to be able to see it. So please try it for you to see how things are. Just a reminder, I know you know this from grade 11. Let me move those a bit. Yes. So this is a different, this is like a, a longitudinal cross-sectional area to show you that the current is going out and then in. So a dot is out, a cross is in. And the magnetic field lines are inside, you know, the blue lines inside the coil. So we can call this a south face of the coil. And this is a north face of the coil. And also you have some magnetic field outside the coil that is very weak, okay? That we're not gonna measure at any time. All right, this is a different picture to show you more the right-hand rule in case you still have difficulties. I love this one because you don't need to change the motion of your hand by simply grabbing the long coil. Uh, the four fingers are the current. You can think of the nails to be the direction of the current and the thumb to be the magnetic field. And please do not use your left hand by mistake. A lot of students do that. Anyway, so uh, now again, discussing the solenoid, we need to use this equation. Anybody saw this equation before? Can you please elaborate what it means? I know it's something simple. Just tell me what you know, what you remember. What's B, what's mu, what's N, what's I? B is the magnetic field where? That's the question. Anywhere? So this equation is only applicable for the long coil. All right, so Yara is saying that this magnetic field is inside the coil and not outside. This is true. To be honest, I need to add something. It has to be at the center. However, if we assume that the solenoid is infinitely long, inside is a good answer because there's no center if we're talking about infinitely long. Mu, yeah, you can call it anything. You can call it the magnetic constant uh, in vacuum because it's gonna change a bit if it's not in vacuum. We're gonna assume it's uh, in vacuum and you have the unit, the, the value for it. So four pi times 10 to the minus seven SI units is what we're gonna use. I'm very interested in small n and big I. So small n is the number of turns of the solenoid. No, that's not true. Small n is actually uh, the number of turns per unit length. So what you would call big N over big L. So to be honest, we don't really care about the number of turns. We care about the density of the numbers. In other words, how many turns you have per millimeter or per meter. So you divide by the whole length, okay? This is very important. So you can change your equation by writing mu zero for vacuum, N I over L, okay? So if I need to discuss a little bit which parameters are proportional? What do you suggest? 
the point, the objective of the lab is to measure the magnetic field. So what would you vary to prove a linear relationship or two parameters or something proportional with the measured value? Yes, by varying I, keeping everything constant and constant, the position of the Tesla meter constant, we will see that the magnetic field will be proportional to I and that's obvious. Yes, uh, we can also, by the way, vary N by trying two different solenoids, for example, 500 turns versus 1000 turns and check that the magnetic field is gonna double or not. And by the way, the only way to prove proportional or not, how do you prove if two uh, parameters are proportional? How do you prove it? Graphically, how Yara would you prove two parameters to be proportional graphically? You, you uh, uh, look for a constant slope. Now let's say, for example, I only have two measurements. And you know, two measurements will always give me a constant slope. And it, it doesn't show me the actual function, that's why. Two measurements only. N1 is 500, N2 is 1000 turns, and I'm gonna have B1 and B2. How do I prove that B and N are proportional? So I cannot plot yet, I don't have many measurements. What do we look for? First step, I would see that the bigger the N, the bigger the B, but that, that's not enough to say proportional or directly proportional. You like to use this. Sometimes you say directly proportional. Okay, they increase with a constant ratio, awesome. So in other words, B1 over N1 would give you a value, B2 over N2 will give you the same exact value. So the ratio is constant. Yes, this is very interesting to see. Thank you, Yara. All right, so now if I move a bit, I'm gonna show you, first of all, the solenoid. So I'm jumping through slides. This is the solenoid I'm using, okay? It's not a super long coil. No, the length is not infinite. Just a second, I'm scrolling. Uh, it looks a bit not cylindrical, like the base looks like a square and then with a certain length. The length, I don't remember, around 8 or 7.5 centimeters. It's very thick. I mean by thick, for you to find the diameter of it, you take the outer diameter and the inner diameter, and then you do add them up divided by 2. And I know for a fact that the diameter is not in the equation of B, but anyway, they would ask you about the average diameter. The length is important. You will measure it with a regular ruler, so I'm discussing the sources of errors or probably the uncertainties of your measuring tools. You will also see that there is a red one here, okay? Okay, so yes, so this is a red solenoid and this is a yellow cell solenoid. If I'm not mistaken, the yellow one will give you big N to be 500 turns and the red one will give you big N to be 1000 turns. So yes, I will want, I want to show you the solenoid I mean the Tesla meter. The Tesla meter is this guy. You can use uh, two scales and the unit is milli Tesla. Probably in the video you can see more. Here I switched everything off. The current on the M meter was zero and I was zeroing the Tesla meter. The Tesla meter is not connected to the circuit. It has a black probe and it's external to the circuit. I will use the probe like a pen. The position of the tip of the probe is the position of the Tesla meter where you can use, you can measure the magnetic field anywhere. You can keep it at the center to do your measurement or you can measure it throughout the, I don't know, any distance or the X axis, okay? Uh, what else? Okay, I'm not gonna show you the steps right now. I will move to the flat coil before I continue. You will be given uh, two different flat coils, one flat coils with N equals 100, so it's not a lot, and another flat coil we have in the lab that is 200 turns, okay? So the unit is turns, 100 turns and 200 turns. And it's really flat. If you want, I can show you this is our flat coil. It's not too flat though, I think the, the, the thickness is two centimeters or three centimeters, not more. 
So yeah, you can consider it flat if you see how big the diameter is. How big is the diameter? Probably 12 or 16 centimeters. I can't remember, I have it written somewhere. So since you compare the diameter to be much bigger or the radius to be much bigger than the length, you can consider that to be your flat coil. Quick reminder, this is how the flat coil looks like. Just a second, yes. Uh, and for the magnetic field lines, you can use exact, the same exact right-hand rule. Probably you can try it. I'm gonna try it actually and then flip my hand because my camera is flipped. So this is the current. I'm gonna use the four fingers. My nails are the direction of the current. The magnetic field is to be is gonna be to the left. Now I'm gonna cheat and do it opposite because you can see my camera opposite to show you the magnetic field. All right. You, I use the right hand rule to see the magnetic field at the center of the coil. However, the magnetic field is not only at the center, it would go inside. You can also do right hand rule on this figure and it's gonna rotate around the wire in both directions. So you see a circular around this wire, a circular behavior around this wire and inside the coil is what, you, what your right hand rule is actually giving you. Right, this is another figure to show you the magnetic field lines. Now this equation. Have you ever saw this equation before? Probably while doing Ampere's law and so on, if you're doing it. But this is something that usually you don't use in your regular physics classes, right? Have you ever saw it before? Yes, so. Yeah, let me explain each term for you to know how to use it because you need to use it. N is definitely the number of turns. I is the current, R is the radius. Now X, what's X? I will take this to be my X axis. So this is your X axis, okay? And so X, I will take the zero at the center of the coil. This is the zero. And this is the magnetic field anywhere on the axis inside at the center of the flat coil, okay? Which means if you want to know the magnetic field at the center, and probably I can write it here. So to find the magnetic field at the center, make sure to replace X by zero. And when you replace X by zero, the R's are not gonna cancel out fully, but probably your equation will look much simpler, okay? You will definitely see that N is proportional, B is proportional to N and B is proportional to I. This is not gonna change. It makes sense actually. The more current, the more magnetic field. The more uh, coils or turns, the more magnetic field. Now, what about the radius? You will figure it out on your own. Okay, it's not a variable, but you can tell. Now, let me show you a bit how the experiment will be. And I care about the circuits. Uh, and I think the circuit is here. Do you think I can scroll? No, let me move those to the side. Even if I scroll a lot. Why is N and not N? Okay, the small N, uh, Karin, is small N is big N over L. And you don't have L in the equation. Okay, so the equation of the flat coil will not use L because L is basically very tiny, it's the thickness of the coil. Let's say I would have big L, I would replace big N over big L by small n, you see? So if you're, uh, if this small n is confusing you, simply replace small n by big N over L, okay? So for, for again, for the flat coil, the length is not something that I can consider. Now back to this circuit, What this, this is what I wanted to show you. I wanted to show you what circuit we had again, yeah. So you had the power supply. I think I used current to be equal to one amperes. Why? Because if I go beyond one amperes, uh, some of my equipment is gonna heat up. If you look at co uh, solenoid one, solenoid two, and flat coil, uh, it's written on them what is the maximum current allowed. Remember, these are basically wires that are simply a wire rotated uh, on itself, coiled on something. So it, it's gonna heat up, you know? There's nothing to protect it. The resistance is very small and the current is gonna be high in it. So some of the coils would say, 
2.5 ampere is maximum allowed. Some would say 1.5 ampere is maximum allowed. I don't know if I zoom in here, I can see the maximum current. It says 2.0 or 2.5 amperes. Anyway, I decided to use one ampere to stay on the safe side. And while doing the experiments, you can touch the coil and you would see it's hot. Not too hot though, but why destroy it by a very high temperature? So I will pick one ampere as my maximum current allowed. If I need to vary the current, I would vary the current from zero to one ampere and steps of 0 0.1. I will show you the tables in a moment. I need to measure the current and the best way to measure the current is using a measuring tool that is called, you tell me, how do you measure the current? So the question is, how do I measure the current? A multimeter and specifically an ammeter or a multimeter on scale ampere. And how do you connect an ammeter? In series, thank you, Janti. I know it sounds so easy to say in series, but when you come to the bench and you want to connect it, students are usually very confused. So the best way to see a series connection between three items is to create a triangle, okay? So do you see the triangle, power supply, coil, and then back to your um, ammeter. And you pick a scale or you put the terminals of the wires, one on calm, and the positive one is on amperes because one ampere is so much bigger than milliampere. Milliampere, uh, the range for milliampere is up to 200 milliampere only, which is 0 0.2. So dealing with one ampere, we're gonna use the terminal ampere and calm on the ammeter, okay? Keep an eye that the current should be constant and then use a Tesla meter to do the measurements. What are the measurements? And this could be a little bit tricky. Probably show you the video of the experiment, then the lab report, because the measurements were tricky for the students who were in the lab. Now for you, probably things are gonna be easier. So this is the video. And I, yeah, I know that you requested it to be not in this size. The new video is happening now are different actually they're uh, yeah they're somehow landscape done by the phone of uh, Ms. Jinan so she's taking my videos right now not for your class though probably I can do new ones for your class uh, next week I don't know anyway you see flat coil two solenoids you see a tesla meter I think this is still stranger to you so I'm gonna discuss it a bit in a moment so here in this case, I'm trying to show you how I'm doing the connection. Tesla meter, M meter, discussing a bit the scale and how it should be in series. How many cables do I need? Basically three only because I need to create a triangle. I'm explaining a bit the solenoid, what's written on it. So yes, you can zoom in and see. And I was saying L is not the length. Nine millihenry is the inductance that we're not gonna use now, and so on. Discussing the maximum current that is important, the length, the outer diameter, the inner diameter. Okay, this is another flat coil, it's red, it has a different N. I'm showing you N is 1000, okay? And then the flat coil, I know we have two flat coils in here. Hello, Roy. So, uh, we have two flat coils in here, but I cannot separate them. So I'm gonna use only one and I'm sorry for the confusion if it's uh, any confusion. Roy, in your absence, we said something. Let me copy paste. Uh, Roy had an emergency, that's why he's late. This, I will definitely send you an email that is official about it. Okay, Roy, but this is for you to know because I would love to hear anything from you. Yes, so Saturday, next Saturday during our class, which means, Roy, we will not have class next week, unfortunately, but I couldn't find a better option. Okay, back to the experiment. Uh, I showed you the ruler I'm using because you need to know smallest subdivision. By the way, that's a regular ruler. If you don't feel like zooming in to see the subdivision, it's just a regular ruler. Okay, it's long, that's the thing. All right, so this is a different view with all the equipment needed. Uh, I will start with the first coil with an ammeter. I'm, I'm getting ready to create a triangle. You see the triangle, one, two, three. So I need three cables. 
Okay, three cables, red, blue, yellow, you can see them. Uh, yeah, I will move the ammeter in a bit. It's out of the scope. Just to show you one ampere. Now the Tesla meter is on and you see it's outside. I think the video is important to explain how I will change. I'm showing you that this is the tip doing the measurements. Okay, so, so again, it's important to understand how I'm taking the measurement inside the solenoid. Okay, here I'm zeroing my Tesla meter and this is something important for you to understand. Okay, now I will start taking measurements. It has to go inside and go outside. I should stop every centimeter. Okay, I think the experiment was over. I'm gonna repeat again on the table, explaining how I need to change my solenoid and repeat the experiment. Do you think, oh, this is another experiment and I think this is more visible because you can see the ammeter, it was out of the video. Oh, you can read one ampere, I love this. Okay. Uh, here in this experiment, I was changing the current from 0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, steps of 0.1 until I reach 1 because I want to see how I would affect B. And you know now that it's going to be proportional. You will be asked to plot and do linear regression and find the error on the slope. Oh, talking about that, can we have a minute, please, to discuss a bit the midterm? You asked me a question and I did not answer back, or probably I did and I forgot. For the midterm, you cannot use Excel because of respondents. Which means for the RMS value, you're actually doing it on the calculator anyway. For the propagation of error, you're doing it on the calculator anyway. For the slope, uh, you have to make sure you know how to put your values on the calculator, find the slope. You don't need the equation of the straight line, only the slope. For the error on the slope, it is a torture to do it without Excel. For many reasons, you either need an Excel spreadsheet to throw your values on and do the calculations, or you need the linest function because it's quick. So it's you will not be required only for the midterm to do the error on the slope. The error on the slope will be a skill that you will learn only for the, for the lab reports. And it's OK. The midterm is not everything. We have 10 lab reports to, to analyze. So I just wanted you to know this. So for the students, and I think uh, you don't exist, for the students who do not know how to find the slope on a calculator, or probably your calculator, make sure you know how to do it. Is it time consuming? I don't think so, because you need to plug the value, click slope. For the Excel, you need to plug to plug the uh, to plug the values, plot them, then click show equation. So probably the calculator is faster, or probably equally fast than Excel. But I wanted you to know this. I don't want this to be a surprise. Probably include that in my email as well for the students who are not with us today. Okay, and I need to say something that probably if the lab if the midterm is multiple choice and it, i think it's going to be multiple choice i'm not fully uh, sure though uh, if it's multiple choice a lot of the answers can be guessed without full calculations let's say they want you to find the average and the rms sometimes you can guess without doing the calculation and sometimes you can see a lot of wrong answers and this would help you guess as well especially if rounding is horrible in some of the answers so I remember last year, we were doing a lot of uh, writing a lot of questions and doing a lot of calculations. However, it was obvious that the answer is A without doing any calculation. You see? Keep that in mind. Have a look at your answers before starting calculating. All right. Anyway, let me continue. So in this section, you see the probe is at the center. I'm not varying the position of the probe. So I vary the current, find the magnetic field. Vary the current again, find the magnetic field again, okay? Without moving the probe. The probe is centered, okay? Yeah, now I'm doing the flat coil. I picked only this one, not this one. And I think the probe has to move inside. Or if you want, I, sent, I fixed the probe and I moved the solenoid. 
I took x to be zero at the center. And then I went from zero to plus five and zero to negative five to find the magnetic field at any position. All right, this could be confusing a bit if you don't know how the lab report will look like. So this is the first part. Effect of length, it's not really length, it's the position of the probe. You would put the position at zero and you move it up to 20. Let me explain what is zero. This is your solenoid, right? Okay, I will take the x-axis like this. This is your x-axis. And zero is here, six or eight centimeters away from the solenoid. I wanted us to see the behavior of the magnetic field outside and inside. So you're gonna start from zero to 20. This is how it's gonna look, okay? You will plot the magnetic field as a function of X. You start from zero, it's gonna be very weak because the magnetic, the, the position is very far. And then it's gonna increase until it reaches the center. The center, at the center, the magnetic field is very high and then it's gonna decrease again. And yes, the behavior is symmetrical, obviously. You repeat the same exact thing for the other solenoid. So you're gonna do solenoid one and solenoid two. So part A and part B are exactly the same experiment. Solenoid one, solenoid two. By the way, the current is constant. It will be given to you. I think it's gonna be one amperes, but please use the results for that, okay? So A, part A, part B, that's it. Now what's part C? Part C, you put the probe at the center and you don't move it anymore, which means I can use the equation B at the center to be equal to mu zero, big N, I over L, okay? Everything is constant except I. And you vary I in steps of the 0 0.1 and until you reach one ampere and not more, by the way, one ampere is a lot. You know, some houses, like those tiny houses, they can live with five amperes. One ampere is a lot. Your TV takes 0 0.1, for example. Or am I wrong? No, it's something like that. A lamp would take a very small uh, value of current, you know, like one ampere is a lot. So you will measure the magnetic field and eventually they will ask you to plot. How do you think B versus I would look like again? Anyone? Yeah, obviously linear because you told me a few minutes ago that it's proportional. So this is how it's gonna look like. You have 10 points. So enjoy linear regression on Excel now that you can. Find the slope, put a good unit for the slope, find the error on the slope, round it well, I still have two students in your class who do not know how to round well, which is okay. Just learn how to do it. Ask me if you need help. And then they want you to deduce n from the slope. How would you deduce n from the slope? Anyone has an idea? How do you find n from the slope? You say that slope equals m u n over l. Okay, m u, mu you mean. So yes, this is the slope. So you say slope equals this, here you find m, okay? So slope multiplied by l divided by mu will actually give you n, yeah, anyway. And you will be requested to find the error on n. Remember, n cannot be decimal because n is the number of turns. I don't know how things would be for you, but I think the error is gonna be big, like two or 10 turns, you know? I'm sorry for the noise. Okay, so that's part C. And now what's part D? Part D is the flat coil. Number of turns would be given, average diameter given, the current probably one ampere given. All right, I should be clear here to tell you that X equals zero is at the center unlike the solenoid. So this is X and this is zero, okay? So this is X equals zero, okay? So plus five would be away, five centimeter away, minus five would be, and then probably they want you to plot. 
Probably I can't remember. And if you will ever plot, you will get something like that probably. Okay. Yeah, because the, the peak is gonna be at the center, which is zero, but probably they will not ask you to plot only to calculate few things. Okay, and that's it. So the lab report is not easy. There is nothing tricky about it. The only problem is you have four parts, part one, two, three, four. Part one, you plot, part two, you plot, and you compare them both. Probably you need to plot on the same graph, I don't know. Part C, linear regression error on the slope, and then find the N with the error on it, that's a lot. Part D is very quick, okay? And since we have a midterm next week, probably I'm gonna give you two weeks to finish this lab report. How about that? Or if not two weeks, at least 10 days. You want this? I need to look into our schedule. If we can skip a lab, we're gonna skip a lab. Otherwise, I will prepare a recorded session for you to watch alone. I hate this. I will not do it unless I have no choice, okay? I will save this PowerPoint with the edit, with the uh, additions, and I will send it to you. I will also stop recording.